Pragmatics is a subfield of linguistics and semiotics that studies the ways in which context contributes to meaning. Pragmatics encompasses speech act theory, conversational implicature, talk in interaction and other approaches to language behavior in philosophy, sociology, linguistics and anthropology. Unlike semantics, which examines meaning that is conventional or coded. In a given language, pragmatics studies how the transmission of meaning depends not only on structural and linguistic knowledge e.g., grammar, lexicon, etc. of the speaker and listener, but also on the context of the utterance, any pre-existing knowledge about those involved, the inferred intent of the speaker, and other factors. In this respect, pragmatics explains how language users are able to overcome apparent ambiguity, since meaning relies on the manner, place, time, etc. of an utterance. The ability to understand another speaker's intended meaning is called pragmatic competence. Etymology <inaudible> 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 The word pragmatics derives via Latin pragmaticus from the Greek pragmatikos, pragmatikos meaning amongst others, fit for action, which comes from pragma, pragma deed, act, and that from prasso, prasso to do, to act, to pass over, to practice, to achieve. Origins of the field Pragmatics was a reaction to structuralist linguistics as outlined by Ferdinand de Saussure. In many cases, it expanded upon his idea that language has an analyzable structure, composed of parts that can be defined in relation to others. Pragmatics first engaged only in synchronic study, as opposed to examining the historical development of language. However, it rejected the notion that all meaning comes from signs existing purely in the abstract space of Lang. Meanwhile, historical pragmatics has also come into being. This field only gained linguists' attention in the 70s. This is when two different schools emerged, notably the Anglo-American pragmatic thought and the European continental pragmatic thought also called the perspective view. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Areas of interest. The study of the speaker's meaning, not focusing on the phonetic or grammatical form of an utterance, but instead on what the speaker's intentions and beliefs are. The study of the meaning in context, and the influence that a given context can have on the message. It requires knowledge of the speaker's identities, and the place and time of the utterance. The study of implicatures, i.e. the things that are communicated even though they are not explicitly expressed. The study of relative distance, both social and physical, between speakers in order to understand what determines the choice of what is said and what is not said. The study of what is not meant, as opposed to the intended meaning, i.e. that which is unsaid and unintended, or unintentional. Information structure – the study of how utterances are marked in order to efficiently manage the common ground of referred entities between speaker and hearer Formal pragmatics – the study of those aspects of meaning and use for which context of use is an important factor, by using the methods and goals of formal semantics. Topic. Ambiguity The sentence, "'You have a green light' is ambiguous. 
Without knowing the context, the identity of the speaker or the speaker's intent, it is difficult to infer the meaning with certainty. For example, it could mean The space that belongs to you has green ambient lighting. You are driving through a green traffic signal. You no longer have to wait to continue driving. You are permitted to proceed in a non-driving context. Your body is cast in a greenish glow, or You possess a light bulb that is tinted green. Similarly, the sentence, Sherlock saw the man with binoculars, could mean that Sherlock observed the man by using binoculars, or it could mean that Sherlock observed a man who was holding binoculars. Syntactic ambiguity. The meaning of the sentence depends on an understanding of the context and the speaker's intent. As defined in linguistics, a sentence is an abstract entity—a string of words divorced from non-linguistic context—as opposed to an utterance, which is a concrete example of a speech act in a specific context. The more closely conscious subjects stick to common words, idioms, phrasings, and topics, the more easily others can surmise their meaning, the further they stray from common expressions and topics, the wider the variations in interpretations. This suggests that sentences do not have intrinsic meaning, that there is no meaning associated with a sentence or word, and that either can only represent an idea symbolically. The cat sat on the mat is a sentence in English. If someone were to say to someone else, the cat sat on the mat, the act is itself an utterance. This implies that a sentence, term, expression or word cannot symbolically represent a single true meaning, such meaning is underspecified which cat sat on which mat, and potentially ambiguous. By contrast, the meaning of an utterance can be inferred through knowledge of both its linguistic and non-linguistic contexts which may or may not be sufficient to resolve ambiguity. In mathematics, with Berry's paradox, there arises a similar systematic ambiguity with the word definable. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Referential uses of language. The referential uses of language are how signs are used to refer to certain items. A sign is the link or relationship between a signified and the signifier as defined by Saussure and Huguenin. The signified is some entity or concept in the world. The signifier represents the signified. An example would be Signified, the concept cat Signifier, the word cat the relationship between the two gives the sign meaning. This relationship can be further explained by considering what we mean by meaning. In pragmatics, there are two different types of meaning to consider, semantico-referential meaning and indexical meaning. Semantico-referential meaning refers to the aspect of meaning, which describes events in the world that are independent of the circumstance they are uttered in. An example would be propositions such as Santa Claus eats cookies. In this case, the proposition is describing that Santa Claus eats cookies. The meaning of this proposition does not rely on whether or not Santa Claus is eating cookies at the time of its utterance. Santa Claus could be eating cookies at any time and the meaning of the proposition would remain the same. The meaning is simply describing something that is the case in the world. In contrast, the proposition, Santa Claus is eating a cookie right now describes events that are happening at the time the proposition is uttered. 
Semantico referential meaning is also present in meta semantical statements such as tiger, carnivorous, a mammal. If someone were to say that a tiger is a carnivorous animal in one context and a mammal in another, the definition of tiger would still be the same. The meaning of the sign tiger is describing some animal in the world, which does not change in either circumstance. Indexical meaning, on the other hand, is dependent on the context of the utterance and has rules of use. By rules of use, it is meant that indexicals can tell you when they are used, but not what they actually mean. Example. I. Whom. I. Refers to depends on the context and the person uttering it. As mentioned, these meanings are brought about through the relationship between the signified and the signifier. One way to define the relationship is by placing signs in two categories, referential indexical signs, also called «shifters» and pure indexical signs. Referential indexical signs are signs where the meaning shifts depending on the context hence the nickname «shifters» I would be considered a referential indexical sign. The referential aspect of its meaning would be first person singular while the indexical aspect would be the person who is speaking refer above for definitions of semantico referential and indexical meaning Another example would be this referential singular count Indexical, close BYA pure indexical sign does not contribute to the meaning of the propositions at all. It is an example of a non referential use of language. A second way to define the signified and signifier relationship is C.S. Pierce's Piercean trichotomy. The components of the trichotomy are the following. 1. Icon, the signified resembles the signifier signified, a dog's barking noise, signifier, bow wow. 2. Index, the signified and signifier are linked by proximity or the signifier has meaning only because it is pointing to the signified. 3. Symbol, the signified and signifier are arbitrarily linked signified, a cat, signifier, the word cat these relationships allow us to use signs to convey what we want to say. If two people were in a room and one of them wanted to refer to a characteristic of a chair in the room he would say, this chair has four legs, instead of, a chair has four legs. The former relies on context indexical and referential meaning by referring to a chair specifically in the room at that moment while the latter is independent of the context semantico referential meaning meaning the concept chair topic <laughs> non referential uses of language Topic: Silverstein's pure indexes. Michael Silverstein has argued that non-referential or pure indices do not contribute to an utterance's referential meaning, but instead signal some particular value of one or more contextual variables. Although nonreferential indexes are devoid of semantico referential meaning, they do encode pragmatic meaning. The sorts of contexts that such indexes can mark are varied. Examples include Sex indexes are affixes or inflections that index the sex of the speaker, e.g., the verb forms of female cosati speakers take the suffix. S. 
Deference indexes are words that signal social differences usually related to status or age between the speaker and the addressee. The most common example of a deference index is the V-form in a language with a TV distinction, the widespread phenomenon in which there are multiple second-person pronouns that correspond to the addressee's relative status or familiarity to the speaker. Honorifics are another common form of deference index and demonstrate the speaker's respect or esteem for the addressee via special forms of address and or self-humbling first-person pronouns. An affinal taboo index is an example of avoidant speech that produces and reinforces sociological distance, as seen in the Aboriginal Diabal language of Australia. In this language and some others, there is a social taboo against the use of the everyday lexicon in the presence of certain relatives mother-in-law, child-in-law, paternal aunt's child, and maternal uncle's child. If any of those relatives are present, a diable speaker has to switch to a completely separate lexicon reserved for that purpose. In all of these cases, the semantico referential meaning of the utterances is unchanged from that of the other possible but often impermissible forms, but the pragmatic meaning is vastly different. Topic the performative J. L. Austin introduced the concept of the performative, contrasted in his writing with «constative» i.e. descriptive utterances. According to Austin's original formulation, a performative is a type of utterance characterized by two distinctive features. It is not truth evaluable i.e. it is neither true nor false. Its uttering performs an action rather than simply describing only examples. I hereby pronounce you man and wife. I accept your apology. This meeting is now adjourned. To be performative, an utterance must conform to various conditions involving what Austin calls felicity. These deal with things like appropriate context and the speaker's authority. For instance, when a couple has been arguing and the husband says to his wife that he accepts her apology even though she has offered nothing approaching an apology, his assertion is infelicitous because she has made neither expression of regret nor request for forgiveness, there exists none to accept, and thus no act of accepting can possibly happen. <laughs> Jacobson's six functions of language Roman Jacobson, expanding on the work of Karl Buhler, described six constitutive factors of a speech event, each of which represents the privileging of a corresponding function, and only one of which is the referential which corresponds to the context of the speech event. The six constitutive factors and their corresponding functions are diagrammed below. The six constitutive factors of a speech event Context Message addresser, addressee, contact, code. The six functions of language: referential, poetasy motive, conative, phatic, metalingual. The referential function corresponds to the factor of context and describes a situation, object, or mental state. The descriptive statements of the referential function can consist of both definite descriptions and deictic words, e.g., the autumn leaves have all fallen now. The expressive alternatively called emotive or affective 
function relates to the addresser and is best exemplified by interjections and other sound changes that do not alter the denotative meaning of an utterance but do add information about the addresser's speaker's internal state, e.g., wow, what a view. The conative function engages the addressee directly and is best illustrated by vocatives and imperatives, e.g., Tom, come inside and eat. The poetic function focuses on the message for its own sake and is the operative function in poetry as well as slogans. The phatic function is language for the sake of interaction and is therefore associated with the contact factor. The phatic function can be observed in greetings and casual discussions of the weather, particularly with strangers. The metalingual alternatively called metalinguistic or reflexive function is the use of language, what Jacobson calls code to discuss or describe itself topic <inaudible> related fields there is considerable overlap between pragmatics and sociolinguistics since both share an interest in linguistic meaning as determined by usage in a speech community However, sociolinguists tend to be more interested in variations in language within such communities. Pragmatics helps anthropologists relate elements of language to broader social phenomena, it thus pervades the field of linguistic anthropology. Because pragmatics describes generally the forces in play for a given utterance, it includes the study of power, gender, race, identity, and their interactions with individual speech acts. For example, the study of code switching directly relates to pragmatics, since a switch in code affects a shift in pragmatic force. According to Charles W. Morris, pragmatics tries to understand the relationship between signs and their users, while semantics tends to focus on the actual objects or ideas to which a word refers, and syntax or syntactics examines relationships among signs or symbols. Semantics is the literal meaning of an idea whereas pragmatics is the implied meaning of the given idea. Speech act theory, pioneered by J. L. Austin and further developed by John Searle, centers around the idea of the performative, a type of utterance that performs the very action it describes. Speech act theory's examination of illocutionary acts has many of the same goals as pragmatics, as outlined above. Computational pragmatics, as defined by Victoria Fromkin, concerns how humans can communicate their intentions to computers with as little ambiguity as possible. This process, integral to the science of natural language processing seen as a sub-discipline of artificial intelligence, involves providing a computer system with some database of knowledge related to a topic and a series of algorithms which control how the system responds to incoming data, using contextual knowledge to more accurately approximate natural human language and information processing abilities. Reference resolution, how a computer determines when two objects are different or not, is one of the most important tasks of computational pragmatics. <laughs> <laughs> Formalization There has been a great amount of discussion on the boundary between semantics and pragmatics and there are many different formalizations of aspects of pragmatics linked to context dependence. Particularly interesting cases are the discussions on the semantics of indexicals and the problem of referential descriptions, a topic developed after the theories of Keith Donnellan. 
A proper logical theory of formal pragmatics has been developed by Carlo Dalla Pozza, according to which it is possible to connect classical semantics treating propositional contents as true or false and intuitionistic semantics dealing with illocutionary forces. The presentation of a formal treatment of pragmatics appears to be a development of the Phrygian idea of assertion sign as formal sign of the act of assertion. In literary theory Pragmatics, more specifically, speech act theory's notion of the performative underpins Judith Butler's theory of gender performativity. In Gender Trouble, she claims that gender and sex are not natural categories, but socially constructed roles produced by reiterative acting. In excitable speech she extends her theory of performativity to hate speech and censorship, arguing that censorship necessarily strengthens any discourse it tries to suppress and therefore, since the state has sole power to define hate speech legally, it is the state that makes hate speech performative. Jacques Derrida remarked that some work done under pragmatics aligned well with the program he outlined in his book of grammatology. Emile Benveniste argued that the pronouns I and you are fundamentally distinct from other pronouns because of their role in creating the subject. Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari discuss linguistic pragmatics in the fourth chapter of A Thousand Plateaus. November 20, 1923, Postulates of Linguistics. They draw three conclusions from Austin, one a performative utterance does not communicate information about an act secondhand. It is the act, two every aspect of language. Semantics, syntactics, or even phonematics, functionally interacts with pragmatics. Three, there is no distinction between language and speech. This last conclusion attempts to refute Saussure's division between Lang and Parole and Chomsky's distinction between surface structure and deep structure simultaneously. Topic. Significant works and concepts J. L. Austin's How to Do Things with Words Paul Grice's Cooperative Principle and Conversational Maxims Brown and Levinson's Politeness Theory Jeffrey Leach's Politeness Maxims Levinson's Presumptive Meanings Jürgen Habermas's Universal Pragmatics Dan Sperber and Deirdre Wilson's Relevance Theory Dallin D. Oakes's Structural Ambiguity in English, an Applied Grammatical Inventory See also Notes <laughs> <laughs>